We're live. Are we? We're rolling. Oh, boy. Guys on YouTube, I never put my podcast on YouTube because nobody watches it. <laughs> I bet. That's, I learned that after like three or four. I was like, I'm not doing YouTube. Plus, it's a pain in the uh, rear to edit. For sure. But uh, we're going to do this one. Um, this is episode number 200 and something. I don't know what on the Elk Shape podcast. If you never listen to my podcast, uh, it's it's a good place for a, like to consume long form media. We talk a lot about archery, elk hunting, fitness, and there's nothing else really to talk about. So <laughs> we do that. And, uh, this one's going to be on YouTube as well. So if you want to watch, or if you want to just have it playing in the background while you do other things, totally get it. Today's guest, obviously right here, none other than Josh Jones, known as MFJJ. And, uh, this is the guy who has always helped me out with my archery game and technically is my archery coach. I still go to Josh even to this day and have him give me, and you, you'd be surprised guys. I, one little tip is all I need at my point to just accelerate my, uh, my practice or if I'm struggling with something and you just get one cue going through your head and you're like, ah, oh, and it's like, it cracks the code. So I, I highly recommend an archery coach. Josh probably isn't for hire. He's too busy. We're going to learn his story today, and uh, it's a good one. So come along. Josh, how are you? I'm fabulous, Dan. How are you doing today? How long have I been trying to get you to do this? A uh, really long time, and uh, just like uh, making videos originally, it took a really long time to get me to do it. Um, but uh, just, I guess for for a long time, I didn't think I had anything of really that much of a value that a wide variety of people would want to hear. So I was like, why are you wasting people's time yeah. <laughs> with this? But uh but, you know, eventually broke it down, did it. And then I had somebody uh, reach out to me um, over Instagram that wanted me to do a podcast. And then it clicked in my head. I was like, oh, Christ, I still haven't done Dan's podcast. I probably ought to do that. So here we are. We pushed it at the top of the list. So yeah. about, I did the I did look yesterday, and it took me forever. I've made a lot of YouTube videos. Uh, yeah. in, tw in 2006 or seven. I made my first YouTube channel. It was called mm -hmm. Dan the Fitness Man. And like an idiot, I deleted that. <laughs> I was like one of the first YouTube channels, and I had Oops. cool stuff on there. I had a mohawk at one point. Yeah, there I you had go. a couple of videos. Like I had a really cool cougar encounter that got tons of views. I ended up deleting that and starting a new one called Train to Hunt. Yeah, and that one really grew fast. It's probably still. I haven't checked, but it's probably still out there. And then when I sold, uh, or when I bought out Kenton and mm -hmm. opened the gym, I decided to start elk shape and I yep. had no ambition to do like what it's doing now. Sure. I just was like, I like making videos. I like sh like a place to, for my hunting videos. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll start elk. So 2013, we started the YouTube channel elk shape. Uh, currently we're over, we finally hit 50,000 subs. Uh, I'm not so worried about subs as much as Tim is. Tim's the guy, Tim producer, Tim is the guy who literally manages the YouTube channel. If you see a reply, it's usually him. If I reply, I'll sign it, Dan. I, I don't yep. have a lot of capacity for that, but yep. YouTube's are arguably my favorite social media platform. Yeah, I agree. Um, and it's it's tough to grow, and I encourage all of you to get your own YouTube channel because we're going to talk about legacy on this podcast. I hope my son Tristan's kids can watch some of my YouTube videos when they're my age. You know what I mean? Sure. And get to know their grandfather or even great grandfather and be like oh that's what he was like he was he was short <laughs> when <laughs> well, he stood next to well, josh on video yeah well how many opportunities do you do your uh, do your your children or friends or whatnot really get to get that close to you or understand or how, how you think or how you act to a degree in an environment like that they get they get so much exposure to your personality and i think that's probably what's really neatest about it and you know, all the videos that we've made, it's just my personality. It's just who I am. Yep. There's nothing fake yeah. about it. And I know you really well. And I know you're just being you. Yeah. Like, just like I'm just being me. It's just, you know. I think people can recognize that. Uh, there's authenticity to it. There's no, there's no fake. Uh, we just are who we are. And, you know, maybe I say things certain people don't like, but that's just what I think. So if you, if you don't like it, that's cool. You know, I get that. You're, you're, everyone's entitled to their own opinion and, you know. Start your own thing and talk about what you think is right, because everyone should be able to share and and um, communicate what they really think and feel without consequence. Unfortunately, you can't always do that anymore. But yeah. I'm a I'm a big you know First Amendment guy. I th I think I that. that and Second Amendment, of course, obviously. But First Amendment or anything, it should you should be able to express exactly how you think and feel Amen. without consequence. And um, and we still, for the most part, can do that on YouTube. 
Um, but yeah, it allows you to be yourself for the most part. And I think that's a, that's a really valuable thing, especially for your legacy. So about three and a half years ago, Josh came on the YouTube channel for the first time. Now he should have been on the channel six, seven years ago because it took that long for me to convince him that, uh, he was really good at what he did and he knew everything I didn't when it came to archery and that YouTube is the perfect place. YouTube is about how to, I should have had a counter for how many times you asked me. <laughs> I should have just kept a tally of it. I kept saying, no, I don't have time for that crap. I'm going to give you, <laughs> I'll give you credit though. Yeah. After the, so we did the first elk shape camp four years ago yeah. and I had Josh help out. And I think it was eye opening for both of us, how much people didn't know. And Sorry, there's really good shop owners. I, I always, I'm not clowning yeah. on shop owners. Shop owners are life when it comes to archery, but there was a lot of bad apples out there, and these guys were like, "Is this what an archery shop owner well, should know?" And I was like, "Not always." Josh is Josh is a rare duck, but we learned that man. People, you had some stuff to say, and people were really intrigued, and they learned. You did a great job at Elk Shape Camp, and then shortly thereafter, you finally agreed to actually give me consistency on you gave uh, me every monday every uh uh, yeah every monday after one o'clock or something like that i started at noon and then the amount of stuff we were trying to fill got too hard to get done by noon so we pushed it back to one now it's like 130 most days and i'm there by seven and my my buddy dougie who gave me my name by the way um he's there at like 536 and then we just try to get all that stuff done and then you know make fun stuff after that so the nickname, guys, is MFJJ. The MF stands for exactly what you're thinking. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> bottom line is, is Dougie, and God bless Dougie, he handles all the fulfillment uh, for Spokane the Valley Archery, nightmare. Podium <laughs> Archery, Podium Archer, and Elk Shape, and the guys are just salt to the earth. But he and Josh are like best friends, and so yeah. they were cutting it up, and he referred to as motherfucking Josh Jones. And yeah. I heard that, and I was like, I'm using that from this point going forward, and it stuck. Yeah, he was the only person who ever referred to me as that um, before then. And I guess it's just my name, so it is what it is. It's not, I don't, it doesn't bother me anymore. Um, And my my kids just chuckle, so I guess I'm not too worried about it anymore. I was more concerned if my kids were going to be like, what do you mean? Like, no, it's uh, it's all it's all, fun. It's all fun and games, man. But yeah, that's uh, that's my my best buddy, Dougie's. we actually, um, he used to work at uh, a car stereo place way back when, when I was a teenager. And that's how I met him through another friend of mine. Cause I was really into car stereos as if you were, you know, came out of the nineties as a, as a teenager. Division? I never did. A lot of my or friends Riverside? did. I was too busy working because right. I, I started working when I was young. I mean, young, young, like I was, um, I was like sweeping floors and moving boxes around when I was like five years old. And my dad, and my dad had a general sporting goods store in Spokane called the, uh, the outdoor sportsman. And I still have people that come up to me and tell me that was their favorite store uh, in Spokane. Where was when it? it closed. It was on the corner of Mission and Division right downtown. I got gotcha. you. There's a, a pet clinic now. I don't want to say right there or right next door. And it was a, another sports store for a while, like more of a skiing, snowboarding, outdoorsy kind of sp- store. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's where I originated at. Um, and when I started working on bows, um, I've been shooting a bow since I was five. And I started working on bows... Oh, like seven or eight, just dabbling with uh, how they worked and what was different about them. And then I was working in the pro shop as a archery expert at 11 years old, which you could imagine was quite a challenge for a 40-year-old man to think an 11-year-old kid can tell him anything. Um, But I'd always, I'd shot a bow since I was like five um, and shot a bow that was like adjustable with sights and things like that at like seven. I started shooting a traditional bow at like 12 um, and then I shot that for like a couple of years cause that was my father's passion. He was a traditionalist and you know, every kid's trying to please their dad. Um, so I started doing that for a while and then I picked up my compound again after shooting my, my recurve religiously for oh, two hours a day, every day, no matter what. Um, and picked up my compound and was more accurate and more efficient with something that I hadn't shot in like two years. And it was very apparent that my clientele was more compound than, recurve so i kind of gave it up at that point i still shoot it periodically but went back to compound and it grew from there but um i think by uh once i could drive i was working 40 hours a week uh running the archery department in that store which had all kinds of sporting goods in it but i ran the archery department in there and it uh 
it grew 30% a year every year for, you know, four years or five years. And when um, the sporting goods business started getting really hard in Spokane, we had a lot more other shops coming into Spokane and opening up a general sporting goods store or a workwear store or an outdoor apparel store. Uh, and each one of them by themselves don't take a lot. You know, they'll take like 2% or 3%, but you get seven of them and then 20% of your profit went away. And now you go from making a decent amount of money to losing a little bit of money every year. So my dad made the hard decision when I, right about when I graduated high school that uh, we were going to just go all archery and move out into the country so we could get away from the major overhead of being in town. Um, and that seemed to work out pretty good. So. And that's where the shop is today. Yeah, and I, I want to say we, we actually moved out there when I was 21 and from 18 years old. I mean, I, always, I was always pretty good with um, bows and working on bows and understanding them, and I'm, I'm a mechanical human being. Mm-hmm. So my brain isn't just satisfied with that's how it works. I want to understand. I don't just want to say, oh, turn it this way for that. I want to, well, why? Why do I need to turn it that direction for that to occur? And that's just how I see things, which is why I can do what I do and why I'm relatively good with every piece of equipment is because I have a greater understanding for it because I refuse to accept that this is just what you do. Like, no, I want to understand why. And fortunately, as, as difficult as it was for me, when I graduated high school, almost every friend I had moved away. They all so went to college. They all went to college, and I didn't. You my, didn't my, go to college. No, I didn't go to college. I almost went into the Marine Corps, actually. Really? Uh, yeah. Um, a good friend of mine uh, was going to the Marine Corps, and I always had this um, back of my head passion of flying. I don't know if it was Top Gun or whatnot when I was Certainly like was. seven, which I was allowed to watch when I was seven years old when it came out, which probably not the best decision on my parents' part, but I, I loved that movie, and I was fascinated with jets, and I used to draw jets and things like that when I was young, and um, a buddy of mine went into the was going to the Marine Corps, and I was like, well, I'll just go down with him, and then they talked me into uh, to taking an ASVAB. Um, and I got done with it and they called me back and said, uh, Hey, um, you got the highest score we've seen in three years. What do you want to do? You can do whatever you want. And then I was like, okay, cool. Well, I want to be a, a Harrier pilot and I want to do the, uh, the navigation program for four years. Well, I get a degree cause you have to have a degree yeah. to be a pilot. Um, and I was all signed up for it, passed and ready to go. And my dad came over to my apartment, um, one evening, um, crying his eyes out, begging me not to do it. And so I didn't, um, cause I, and I don't know if he was crying my eyes out because he was afraid I was going to die or crying his eyes out because uh, he, he he was just losing his last kid because I was the baby of the family. Yeah. And the other two kids didn't have any interest in the business. Um, and I still did um, and was making a different decision. So I never I never got to ask him that. I never I guess I never did ask him that. I wish I did. But right. uh, of why, you know, was it you were afraid I was going to die or was it you were just afraid to lose me uh, in the business? But that... Um, that made me change my path. And then shortly thereafter, the last couple of friends that I really had locally were gone. And, you know, you're always going to make more friends, but I had an immense amount of free time on my hands. So I worked in the shop. Uh, back then, I probably worked about 60 hours a week. I think I took one day off a week. I think this is what people need to understand right now. You're about um, to, uh, like, this is where Josh is going to unveil. This is why he's MFJJ. So because he took a, an unusual path of, I'm going to just say it, kind of rescuing mom and dad's business this will be the first of we'll talk about the other time or more that i don't know of. but this is where josh starts to create a laboratory where he's going to do his own mfjj r and d and quite honestly without these next few years that you're about to talk about i know you wouldn't be who you are yeah. based on and you just this is where you become the yoda the wizard yeah. uh, you're a young jedi at age 18, 19, staying, you, you turn that opportunity down. Let's get into what, like, the behind the scenes of, like, okay, yeah, you're, you're graduated, but, dude, you're at the shop, and that's all you do. Yeah, I, um, I, I had an apartment. Um, uh, well, let me back up just a little bit. My, uh, uh, the day, I, day after I graduated high school, um, I, was, I was getting a little, uh, I, get, I don't know if it's defiant or uh, me and my dad had a blowout like my junior year to senior year. So I don't remember the exact days. So we actually got in our first physical fight. Only one we ever had. Did you lose? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I, I was winning. And then he uh, he headlocked me and bounced my head off the kitchen counter. And I saw stars. And then I just blew out of the house. Oh, God. And it was in the middle of winter. And I walked like 
God, it was like five miles to my girlfriend's house, just fuming mad. And eventually she brought me back home. And I, uh, you and cooled down. I just, I, you know, he was, he was the alpha and that was just how it was going to be. And I just had to accept that. And I, I still don't think he ever apologized to me for he bouncing shouldn't. my head off a counter, which, you know, I, I get that. But, um, and, and, but I did apologize to him. Um, I do, I do remember that. I what think is that the was, deal with us men? Like when I was 16, uh, ego. <laughs> have you ever met my dad? Nicest guy in the world. Literally, most yeah. people don't even like. Once they get to know my dad, they're like, "Are you sure you're related?" Dan's so. You do. You have very different driven, personalities, and you're so cool and laid back. Very but, um, different. Yeah. When I was 16, I remember, I remember getting in my dad's face, defiant. Yeah. And um, we didn't get in an altercation. Yeah. Looking back, I'm glad because he would have whooped my ass. I thought I was yeah. so tough. But, uh, yeah, I just distinctly remember in the living room, I think I might even pushed him or got right into his face. Mm -hmm. And uh, my dad's, again, the nicest guy ever, but he would have whooped my ass. Yeah. And I don't know. Looking back, there's a weird transition. It's dad from strength, man. <laughs> 16, 17, 18, 19, where whatever my dad would tell me to do, I would do the opposite, sure. even in life advice. Sure. And by the time I was 19, and guys, this has not changed. I don't make a decision without running it by my dad. Yeah. Isn't that funny? It is funny. It is funny. Um, so anyway, shortly thereafter that, um, I graduated high school and I think it was, I, I'd, I'd been given a week off of work during my graduation. Um, and I think part of it was because I wasn't, I was kind of messing up a little bit of work and it was more of like a, here's a warning, go home for a week. <laughs> and you know, I'm, I'm graduating high school and I know that's the end of my education and you know, whatnot. So I, I was a little unruly. I want to say I got in trouble when they when it was time to hand out the diplomas. I was the the tallest kid in my class, so I was last. And when they got to my name, they stopped because I was about throwing beach balls around and whatnot. And they stopped, and it was like it uh, it was in the oh the Met downtown or whatnot, Coliseum. right? Call it, oh yeah, whatever you call it, the the big event center, right? Yeah. And there's you know a thousand people in there and whatnot. And it gets down to me, and they stop for like two minutes, and I'm trying to remember. Uh, I'm going to get this wrong. And I, I don't remember the teacher's name that uh, that said it to me. And he goes, you having fun up there? I said, yeah, pretty much. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and he goes, he goes, I can make this take a really long time. And I looked at him straight in the face and I said, you can make it as long as you want, but you still got to give me my freaking diploma. <laughs> 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 and they called out my name and I walked across and got it. But So I, to give you a little glimpse, I was getting defiant. And I was kind of stretching my own legs for my own independence and and at the time, I didn't realize it, but my dad probably saw that and went, he needs to get out of the house now. Yeah. So I think two days after I graduated, during my week off, he, uh, he said, um, he, I came downstairs to the uh, my dad's man cave, yep. um, which is uh, now my man cave. My mom bequeathed it to me. Nice. Um, but, uh, and he said, well, get dressed. We're going to find you a place to live. And two days later, I was living in an apartment in downtown Spokane with everything I owned in it. Nice. And, out um and that was a, a pretty big shock um it forced me to grow up really quick because then i i couldn't be the defiant person anymore because i needed the money i was making i couldn't just live on it and mind you i was making 525 an hour at that Damn. point yeah <laughs> yeah well that was what minimum wage was and yeah. my dad always paid me minimum wage because uh, i was a kid and it took me a while to realize that i needed to ask for something different but in any event when i got to that point all my friends move away. I don't go into the Marine Corps, um, which I have a ton of respect for military people, largely That's because sad. of that, because I almost went down that path, and I, 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 I felt more of a calling, but I just got talked out of it. In any event, um, I would work till 7 o'clock at night, and then I, I lived eight blocks away. I walked to work frequently instead of driving my rig. I, th I think I started my rig like three times in a year once because I just never drove it because I was four blocks from a grocery store, eight blocks from work, and three blocks from a video store. I didn't need anything else yep. from, as an 18-year-old kid, you know. But um, I would stay at the at, uh, the shop there, um, and when it was closed, you could shoot like 40 yards inside. So I would stay and tinker and tinker and Absolutely. tinker from like 7 p.m. till 11, 12, 1 sometimes for three years straight. Like I'd go home sometimes if I had a party or friends came over that sort of thing, and there was a there was a period of time where my brother and I had like a show we liked to watch, so we met up once a week and watched the show and hung out for an evening or that sort of thing, and you know had pizza and watched a, a TV show or that sort of thing. 
Um, but outside of that, I mean, that's what I did. And I did that for like three years until I felt like I really understood all the different systems of a bow. So basically, so I could do a better job. Um, I didn't like getting stumped. And at that point, at like 18, I would get stumped with something and I would call the manufacturer and they couldn't answer it for me. So I knew there were things that that were going on that were, they weren't even aware of at the time. I think they're a lot better about that now. But, you know, you'd get a tech person on the phone and they couldn't do anything more than you already did. So I, I learned at that point, if I really wanted to do better, I was going to have to f- dabble and figure it out. And I spent, you know, three years of my my 18 to 21-ish, you know, 18 and 20, 18 to 21, just basically screwing off. In a, what in a years shop. were those? That was uh, 98, 99, 2000. Okay, so that's why when we have discussions on the YouTube and people – I'm trying to say things super nice. I'm trying to like, <laughs> I'm trying to be respectful, but I can come across kind of just a dick when I say stuff. So I got to like be careful. Josh just knows more than you. And a lot of people need to understand like the guy has tinkered. So when people ask me, dude, why do you helical to the left? Is it because your bow clocks left? Is it because this or that? Have you ever tried four veins? Have you ever tried a two degree offset or a one degree? I am not like Josh, but I'm at a point bow hunting for 20 years where I have tried a lot like every I have tinkered to death to try to figure out what works and so there's just certain things that work for me and I'm way behind Josh on this continuum this educational experimental continuum Mm -hmm. and uh the first time I really realized that you're a mad scientist is when I I tried to explain on video why I don't shoot a QAD yeah. And you were in the video. And this yeah. is not that long ago. You could go find the video. It's an RX3 Hoyt bow mm-hmm. build. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, yeah, I don't like it because uh, it could. it's got a high degree of maybe breaking the way, in where I elk hunt in the brush country. Higher, yeah. And then you're like, you come on and you talk about how the spring on a QAD versus a ham ski. Mm-hmm. You talk about which way the spring wants to go, how you could reverse the ham ski to make it like a target bow. You mm-hmm. went into all the mechanisms and I'm like, did you go to school for this? Like, and you're there, just there like, I started to learn it. that <laughs> you were the true ABT guy. Yeah. You were the tinkering guy when everyone else was partying and chasing girls, yeah. you were doing that. Yeah. And it's, that's kind of why you're you have a special gift. So, when did you realize that you're like, man, I I do know kind of a lot of I have tried like I've heard you explain at camps yeah. every cam system ever made and how they're all similar and different. Yeah. Which I couldn't do right now. Sure. Like when did you start diving into like the engineering, the science and like how did you learn all this stuff? Uh when somebody couldn't answer the question for me. Cuz I don't like that answer. Yeah, I just don't. If you're if you're telling me this is this arrow is kicking right for what, or this this particular setup is kicking right out of the bow, and saying, well, you know, you can do this and you can do that. And I'm like, well, that doesn't make sense. What do you mean? Why? Why? I don't get it. And they said, well, I don't know. That's just the rules. And I was like, well, I don't I don't like that answer. So when I had free time or when I wasn't busy or when I could shut the shop down, turn on whatever music I wanted, lock all the doors, turn off all the lights, but like three and start to experiment and start moving things around and figuring out what was causing things is when I really started to click in my head of, okay, there's an answer to all these things. And if you can't find the answer, I guess you need to answer it yourself. Um, this is pre YouTube. Well, this, this, is, is this is pre podcast. Any, yeah. This is pre internet forums. This is, this is, yeah, the resources I, this is pre smartphone. This, is, <laughs> this when... is, yeah, I, I was the first, one of the first kids to have a cell phone cause I had a job that yeah. I knew of, but I think I got my first cell phone when I was 18 or something like that, you Same know, and it didn't yep. have internet access or anything like that for, oh God, no, damn near another decade. Um, but yeah, this was before you, you could really number? have, uh, no, same cell phone number? no, 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 I do. I have had the same phone number for, I want to say 15 years, okay. but I had a different one prior yeah. to that. Um, I don't even know if did I you ever have a pager. Now. Yes. I had a pager before I had a cell phone. Yeah. Yes. I did have a pager. Kids are like, what is it they talking yeah. about? Yeah. It just sends you a number and you go to a landline and call. You go yeah. to a pay phone. Yeah. You go to a pay phone. And yeah. then there's certain codes that you and your friends make. Yeah, so, exactly, you know. exactly. But I didn't have that very long because I had a cell phone shortly yeah, after. Was so like, I was a little older than you, and um, and it got to where I need, I'm moving out of my house. Yeah. It's like, well, I don't need a home phone if I just have a cell phone. Yep. And there's not multiple people here, so it, it would just made sense for me mm. at that point. But, but yeah, those those years of of dabbling and my dad, um, 
instilled in me what I would call a ridiculous work ethic. Um, like nothing was really ever good enough for him. So it, it consequently turned me into where most people would work 40 hours a week. I'd work 60 or 70 or 80 or, you know, whatever it took. And then when we, when we moved, so in like 2000, we moved the, uh, the general sporting goods store cause we didn't own it. We didn't own the building. And my dad and I built a, a pole building at our current location on property that he owned that was next door to his house. And we put up this big building and then spent about a year transition of still had the shop there, but built a range and sent people out there and sold memberships to there. And then at the, um, uh, the Bighorn Sports Show in March that year, we moved everything to the Bighorn Sports Show and had this giant event. Yep. And then moved it out to the new location and closed the store at that point. And for a year or two, it still didn't really kick off really hard. And we went from bringing like five or six or seven employees to at one point it was just me, just me and my dad. And my dad didn't really do anything. He's, mm. He sat in the room and stressed because all he ever knew was how to manage and how to, you know, make, try to make decisions, which he was never really good at making a decision. Um, but he just knew how to work hard. He, well, he just knew how to make sure other people worked hard. <laughs> I think it's probably the best <laughs> way to awesome, do it. That's awesome, though, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a good way to go. So he, he would have been at home in 1910 in a factory. Yeah. He would have been great. Like, he'd, he had the perfect mindset for that. Mm-hmm. Um, but in any event, I ended up working, oh, God, there's about a five-year period of time there where I was dang near the only employee. I mean, we might have one here or there. Um, cause we couldn't afford more than that because for what it took for my parents to survive and then to pay me a not even very good wage, um, it barely broke even at that point. So it was a, mm. it was a hard struggle for a long time and I didn't, I, I went to work sick all the time Yeah, cause I couldn't take a day off. I didn't have a vacation in five years. I couldn't go, I couldn't take a, a week day to go hunting. I had to take go close day to go hunting. I could go out two days a week and that's it. Couldn't take a vacation day. Couldn't nothing. Sick days, birthdays, whatever. Didn't matter. Couldn't do it. Um, so I guess I had the discipline of a business owner, but wasn't a business owner, um, for about five years till it finally started making enough money that we could afford a couple employees and had enough work coming in that we could have a couple employees, but it was still a big struggle until he eventually sold it to me. When did you start, um, making some of the business decisions as far as so when you run a, an archery shop, you have to figure out, well, what do people, what are they coming in here for? Um, what's the, the product picking? Greatest, what product to order? Um, that kind of stuff. Like, I mean, I was doing that. I was, I was going to buying shows and trade shows at like 14 years old you were. and 15 okay. years old and, okay. and picking the archery stuff. Yes. Then. So I always was That's making that insane. decision. Um, well, I mean, I, w- I was into it and I understood it. And back then it wasn't nearly as complicated now as far as choices. Like right. there was, there wasn't nearly the companies. I mean, there were still companies, but it was like, I still remember when Cobra made the first uh, fiber optic pin site. Mm-hmm. Like there was a fiber optic in the pin and the, and it was sixty four ninety nine for an ascent. I think they called it. And dude, we sold a thousand of those things. Because nobody had fiber nobody optics. Had like yet. it was a metal pin. And if you wanted it to glow, you had to like paint it with jig paint and glow in the dark luminescent paint and just to get it to like have some kind of brightness to it. Yep. And uh, when that first came out, that was just giant. And that was, and that, that's kind of that time I want to say it was like, it's probably like 97, 98 is when things kind of started to have more of a role in innovating. And I think as much as I don't want to, you know, plug the evil empire Matthews here. They were the first bow company. Uh, yeah, right. Oh. They were the first bow company to make it, I guess, more of a thing for innovation every year, or try to right. try to advertise more the innovation over the brand. I think they they'd like pick something That's that really they did that they really focused on, and they also were the first bow company to to venture away from the sales rep format. So, for people who don't understand the archery industry. Almost every bow company is represented locally by a, a sales rep group, and they get paid a percentage of every bow that gets sold to that area or territory. Um, and it, it varies, and I, I'm not going to get into the functional numbers of it because I don't do that, and I don't want to miss information here, but they're paying a percentage of every bow sale out to somebody else. Well, Matthews went, well, why don't we just spend that on advertising and not have that? 
and they're the first company that did that, and it has served them well, and they still, to this day, they have in-house sales reps, you know, people that work at the factory. They're W-2 employees. Answer, yeah. Yeah, they have people that answer their answer the phone calls and have a direct connection to the, the bow manufacturer, but they were making a different enough product that had enough of a, an excitement behind it that it, it worked, and it worked well, and that's still the same formula they use today, which is a large reason why they're the largest bow manufacturer in the United States for United States sales. Yeah. Um, not internationally, they're not, but nationally, they are. Mm. Um, but that was when I would say more. It's like people started looking at it differently. Yeah. It was like all of a sudden I needed to know what the new thing was this year, and I don't remember feeling that way before that. Now maybe I was just too young and ignorant and didn't see it because I was a kid pri- pre that. Um, but I really felt like there were actually strides being made by bow companies and then aero rest companies and then sight companies and they they started really trying to innovate more like making bigger steps in my opinion and that's when it really started to steamroll into this knowledge bus of product and yeah fortunately i it's funny most of the the bows that we work on today the rules that i learned on how to make them work right are from 1990 that's awesome because it's a similar system and they, they finally went full circle to it and i do have to commend Hoyt for when they finally went away from a two cam bow, which is the, you know, the evil word. Um, they wrote a three paragraph lecture on the first page of their catalog that year that said, this is the most accurate thing. And is this we when they fully went to believe. Cam and a half? Yes. Okay. Or it's when they first released single cam bows. Oh, okay. Or no, no, that was the cam and a half year. Yeah. They started making single cams, but they still made dual cams. And when they switched to no more dual cams being made, that year, the catalog, I wish I could find one, but it was like this three-paragraph lecture wow. of how this is truly the best system, and we fully believe we'll be back here someday, but you guys don't want it, so we're making something else, which Hoyt's done that over the years. Like when uh, uh, oh, Matthews actually did that, too, at one point. They were like bashing a cam and a half system, and they spent all their advertising dollars on bagging on the system, oh, and man. it brought so much attention to it that it, it sparked their sales. And I have my sales rep saying, we could never spend that kind of money on advertising dollars. So kudos, thanks for doing it. Because oh it made gosh. them look at it yeah. out, of, out of pride. And I think every manufacturer's made a mistake or two out of pride and ego instead of, we all you know, do. We all, we all do it. We all do it. And they've, they've all, everyone's fallen victim to it over the years. Well, you talked about Hoyt. That is what <sighs> I was wanting to buy. In 2001, I got back into hunting. Mm-hmm. My dad took me out. We went deer hunting, found elk in this state, Washington, on public land. A unicorn back then. <laughs> and went to the general store and bought an elk tag the following weekend, opening mm-hmm. rifle. Went back to where we found those elk. My dad called one in. Within five minutes, I shot it with a rifle. And I don't think I looked through the scope. It was like a 20-yard yeah. outside, five, <laughs> five by five. And we listened to the, the cassette tape on how to make calls on the way in the morning, in the dark. Yeah. So this was a long time ago. But the audio cassette was nothing but bow hunting. Like all I could hear was elk screaming. It was a yeah. Primo's tape, audio, and they coming yeah. in through the brush. And then you hear the dump of the string and the thwack. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I just remember that. When, after I killed that bull, I was like, uh, how do I do that? And then yeah. I went to – and you're going to help me remember the facts on this. So okay. I went to Deer Park because we lived pretty far north Yeah, to buy a bow. Was that a pawn shop or an archery shop? That was an archery shop. Okay, that so was I, uh, Whitetail Plus, and they actually uh, – they made archery targets there, and then oh. they had a small archery shop in it so they they had some of the original shooting sacks which was like a burlap sack with dots painted on it full no of plastic way. garbage basically and they were like 30 dollars. we sold them we sold a ton of them That's like cool. it was it was the first because most of the targets back then were like near homemade kind yeah. of things because people were up till that point were still shooting like a hay bale right no doubt. so yeah but that was white tail plus and That's that, where that was I went, there man. that was there for a long time and you know what uh, i bought a buy? martin cougar yeah and they also had a martin pantera yep and I, I had my first real good job. I was a personal trainer, mm-hmm. and I bought my dad the Pantera. Mm-hmm. I bought me the Martin. I came home with double fisting bows, and I was like, guess who's going archery elk hunting? Yeah. We are. Did I go – did I know about Josh yet? No. Did yeah. I have an archery coach? No. Did I teach myself how to do everything wrong? Absolutely. freaking uh, And so the very next year, I was archery elk hunting mm-hmm. in Idaho with my uncle, and I literally told all my personal training clients – I'm not available. I'm like, I'm going elk hunting the entire month. 
that's my personality and um jealous (laughs) i don't think i've missed an entire elk season since so i do have a lot of experience in there but i was doing i mean this is not the point of the podcast but the very i only hunted with that bow for a couple of years and did i ever kill anything with it yes i killed my first whitetail buck Mm -hmm. um and it wasn't until 2005 i had decided i was going to go to alaska yeah for my 21st birthday Mm-hmm. And I was going to sponsor the trip myself. I was going to go solo. Mm-hmm. I was going to get dropped off. I was just going to go hunt the tundra solo. And I was like, I need to get a new bow for this. And so I went down to Spokane Valley Archery. And that is where I met Josh Jones the very first time. And you were the only person in the store. I, mm-hmm. I remember that for a fact. And you sold me my first bow. And I, I think it was an, a VTech or an X-Tech. I can't remember what it was. We've looked it up before. Um, I think you had a Pro-tech. Razor Tech. Wasn't it, was it a Razor Tech? Man. I don't know, but that's the first bow what I year, bought. What year was it for sure? Uh, probably 2003 or four. So if it was three, it would have been a Razor Tech. If it was four, it probably would have been a Viper Tech. Viper Tech. Yeah. I don't know how you know that. There's but. a lot of worthless crap <laughs> rolling around that skull, man. <laughs> and you set it up top to bottom. <laughs> yep. Top to bottom. Yep. And I killed my first um, animal a couple weeks later in Alaska. I shot my first caribou. Mm-hmm. And um, man, ever since then, I've been coming to your store and I was kind of in the hunting industry a little bit, but never really big time. But you and I were always friends. And I, to be honest with you, I got to the point where I wouldn't let any of your employees yeah. touch my stuff. Yeah, I was like, when's Josh going to be there? I'd call ahead, I'd find out, and I'd stalk you. And I would just make sure that you were the only one that would touch my bow. Yeah. It didn't take me long to figure out this guy's a, a mad scientist. And that's kind of where we started our relationship. We didn't know fast forward a decade plus later that we'd be making awesome content together and stuff. Sure. Um, but that's kind of where we got the connection. And then I will say Josh is the main reason that I shoot for Matthews. Um, and the brief story of that is, is like we had started YouTubing together. Like I mentioned four years ago, I finally convinced him to come on the channel. And this is pre Tim Connor pre-producer tim mm-hmm. so my videos were pretty raw now i had an editing background by the way yeah like i knew how to no, edit videos but not like tim yeah tim Tim's special a unicorn tim's very special and uh we and did i mean our... that in a very positive way i don't mean that in a negative way he's, yeah he's got a he's got an eye and a knack for that that very few people he's would brilliant. have he really is He's, and he's really uh, brilliant. you're brilliant when it comes to bows he's brilliant yeah. when it comes to production and then i'm just the guy who tries hard so it's kind of this cool thing that got mixed in together but we started getting pretty frequent Mm -hmm. on the videos and it's not that i i I wanted to to quit quite but you had put a word in for me with i don't know you explain this well i kind of saw the direction that you were going and i was like are you like is this serious is you really going to go this route and you're going to go this route hard and you're probably looking for you know a company that's going to want to grow with you in this sort of field. And he yeah. said, yeah. And I said, well, you're shooting the wrong company in my opinion. Cause I knew, I knew how they spend their dollars. Yeah. That's what it really boils down to. And I went, if you really want to have a long-term future with this, I, I think you need to switch brands to be honest. And, um, you know, people can hate me for that decision, but the, the end of the day, the, um, that company has a bigger budget than anybody for support. That doesn't take away from, whether or not they make a great product, they do make a great product. They just have a different business model than everybody else does. So there's more money for that than anybody else. So if you want to grow, that's the company to grow with, in my opinion. And I, you said, well, I, I really, I really think I want to do that. And I said, well, I'll make a phone call. Made a phone call. They called you. You worked it out, and it's been a pretty prosperous relationship with you, for you. I'm, I would assume. At this you know, point. it was. I think I showed you that I was serious. Before you made that phone call, because I had become a firefighter, I was still running a gym, and I remember, I remember I, I sold the gym mm-hmm. and I quit firefighting and I was going all in on elk shape. And you're like, Yeah, I think that's oh, about when we had the conversation. You're, you're serious, and I was like, Yeah, man, I I, I love this. I want to do this. But so we started making the YouTube videos, and it really picked up. And that I didn't know at the time that it was going to blossom into what it is today. But I will give Tim Connor all the credit for convincing josh to do his own youtube channel and tim is 100 i will give tim credit in that he's always on video telling you guys to do it start your own channel 
it's free. Instead of getting on there and typing out nasty comments, yeah. <laughs> take that energy and go make yeah. a video on what you think. Exactly. And I still believe that. And, and he really got you to go all in. And then fortunately, credit to you, Josh, um, you're a lot like me, maybe even more so when you decide to do something. You, dude, you go for it. Well, uh, let's just say if I, if I can see that something has value or fruit to it per se, um, and I see a reaction from it, I can, I, I will commit to something. And if I do something, I, I get a little obsessive, I guess. Um, I don't, like I said, I don't like to not understand why or anything like that. So I have yeah. more of a tendency to understand all of it and make sure it's as good as it can possibly be. And, and, uh, it's been a very shocking response. And I, I do credit that a little bit to, um, to doing that first elk shape camp with you yep, and the comments that we got back from it and having a, con a what I considered a relatively basic conversation and that almost every person's eyes in the room, one of them was from our area. Yeah. Um, so I wasn't really paying much attention to that person cause I'd already talked to them a lot and they, you know, they knew, I knew they knew a decent amount, but some of the more basic conversations I had eyeballs were like giant and like, I've never heard anything like this before. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you're kidding me. So that's not to say that um, that there's not really good archery shops out there. There are. There's a, bunch. There, there's a bunch, but there's a bunch that aren't very good. So and there's a it it uh, enlightened me to even more of how little bit of information there is available to those people. And I had always told myself, you know, whether you believe me or not, it's kind of your own decision. But I knew I wasn't going to be rich with what I was choosing to do with my life. So what am I really doing here? said, I am trying to make this sport better for the people in it, no matter what. Because if I make better archers, there's more archers. That's more people trying to continue bow hunting and trying to stimulate bow hunting and trying to give back to bow hunting. So there's bow hunting for my kids and their kids and the kids after that. And so I always said that that's my goal and that's what I'm doing. And then when I realized that there's actually a way to get a larger group of people knowledge because if those people have knowledge, they're going to be better at it. If they're going to be better at it, they're going to bring more people into it. And then those people are going to be better at it. So um, it, was never a, it was never a purpose for monetization at all. I'd never even thought about that. It was, well, if, I can, if people are actually going to learn something from this, I should share. And at first I was a little scared because I, I, didn't, you know, wanna, I didn't want to be useless at a certain point to the public. I wanted to... Um, you know, still be useful and versatile. And I quickly learned over the years of somebody buying my old bow press or something like that when I bought a new one in the shop to use and they'd dick up their bow 20 times and I'd still have to that fix it. Familiar. And I, I went, well, okay. So if they got their own press and they're still going to screw it up, they're still going to need me. So yeah. I, I became very quickly not afraid of that. Um, it was never an intention to sell direct to the consumer or to have an online store. It was, they're always going to need me. So, and then... Once I started being like, okay, you guys need to work on your own stuff and here's some information of how to do it and I'll start making videos related to that. I went, well, how are they getting the equipment? And there was very few people selling any equipment and most of them weren't even carrying it. They were just, you know, turning an order in somewhere else and it would get shipped from somewhere else. Right. And I'm like, well, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this with the intent of creating and carrying everything that a guy needs to work on his own stuff. So that's really more what I've focused on in the, in the online sort of thing was kind of my intent, but I just, I wanted to, I wanted to make people better. That was, I wanted to, I wanted to make the sport sustainable for the long haul because eventually if we get enough archers, when votes happen on what happens to archery from a state level, we'll have a big enough voice that something will occur. But if we don't, when they start trying to make changes, our voice is so small, How it's not going to matter. in Spokane, between you and me, are not hunters, but they know you and they know me? How many people in this town right here know that we have only spun a positive light? Whether they see my stuff on Instagram or your Facebook or they've met you a in lot. person. I don't, like, I don't know. That's it's, the thing, guys, lot. is staying, being a beacon of light on the positivity that bow hunting is. And I've, I've been criticized for killing multiple elk in a year. Do you know how many potlucks and parties at my gym that have been prov basically sponsored by the elk meat that I packed yeah. off the mountain? And yeah. they're like, this is elk. So you hunted this and there's a connection 
that's freaking interesting, man. But I wanted to segue back to people wanting to work on their own stuff. The best thing that ever happened to me is when I fully committed and you guys can go back and watch the video on YouTube where I was like, all right, I'm going to do a bow build series is my, and I'm going to do it top to bottom behind the scenes. People didn't know, but I had to go to the archer shop after every video and basically what I screw up, what did I do wrong? <laughs> but that really was, I never regret that because that video catapulted my confidence to understand how bows work and understand how to set one up from start to finish and making YouTube videos with you has taught me just on video, just being there filming, editing, yeah. and I get to go back and edit these. And man, and then I was like, well, then these people watching are probably learning along as well. Well, and this is a this is a great example of what I was talking about. Is like when you actually tried to do it yourself, and then understood what you did wrong, and still were like, I'd rather you do it, but I know how to do it. Yep. Then you have a better idea of what's going wrong when it goes wrong, and 100%. you can fix it at the time. And you are guaranteed a better archer today than you were then. And uh, and not from just the standpoint of I know how to work on my bow. It's my bow shoots better because I know when things go wrong, what it likely is because I worked on it. And I, I've had really good shooters in this area that don't want to work on their own bow. And I've had to sit down with them after like four or five years and say, look. If you don't start working on your own bow, you're only going to get so good mm -hmm. because you're not going to be able to identify the cause and effect of what happened. Mm. So if you, if you go, why am I shooting high all of a sudden? And then you just walk into me and go here, I'm shooting high. What happened? For 15 right? years. That was. And now that you at least have some kind of, you don't have to be an expert. Mm -mm. Okay. But you have to understand how the thing works right. to be able to resolve something like that. And then have a, and then when you feel like you can resolve something like that, all of a sudden your confidence goes from like an eighty percent to a ninety five percent. It makes a big difference in your ability to shoot. All the other stuff aside, which is the point. One thing that I would add to that, and this is all credit to you, is like my bow kit. When I go elk hunting for a month in multiple states, my bow kit has changed to exactly what I need to the parts that could potentially fail. fail. Yeah. Whereas years ago, I would just be like, uh. I need a backup bow. Now, I mean, I really could get away with, you know, obviously taking one bow mm -hmm. and the right parts. And that's that's something I, I plan on doing with you down the road is continuing to evolve and tinker and watch you you grow as well. So how many YouTube subscribers do you have right now on the Podium Archer YouTube? Almost 15,000. And how many did you have one year ago? Oh, I my first video that wasn't made by you originally was less than a year ago. That's awesome. So that's growth like I've never seen. And I imagine you'll catch up to us because. I don't know, man. I, I keep, the, I'm watching the pace and yours is growing faster. And mine, Tim says that's because you have more followers. So it helps steamroll it a little bit, but I don't know if I'll catch you. I'll, I'm going to try though. I think, here's what I think about Cause that. Cause I am competitive. <laughs> People want to learn like how to grow their following stuff. Here's what I've learned about YouTube and Instagram. Um, I'll just start with Instagram, which I had less than 10,000 followers forever. And I remember being like, yay, I hit 10,000 one time and mm -hmm. I can, now I can do a swipe up link. Mm -hmm. Now you can add a link. But before that, you couldn't add links and stories unless you had 10,000 followers. Mm -hmm. And then it was a struggle to get to probably another 5,000 or whatever. But once I hit 20, 25,000, and right now I don't know where I'm at, but I'm not quite to 40K. Uh, and that's not that big of a following compared to others. But again, comparison is the thief of all joy. Yeah. But I will say it's had, it has snowballed to where... I'm getting followers probably right now during this podcast, several. Mm -hmm. And same with YouTube, YouTube, even more so like the bigger you get, the faster, the faster it, just it steam keeps. rolls. So I think yeah. you're, you're definitely, once you hit, I would say 20, 20,000 subs on YouTube, mm -hmm. um, it will be like that. And you're going to be at 30 and 40 and 50. Oh, and okay. hopefully this keeps up because Tim and I have this goal to hit a hundred K Tim's really pushing for it. I'm along for the ride. I'm like, all I want to do is go elk hunting, Tim. So whatever, if that's our goal, let's work towards it. We set those goals. But sure. what's your vision? That's what all this was to get to is what's your vision for your business, PodiumArcher.com, Podium Archer on YouTube, Spokane Valley Archery. What is your vision? Where are you guys going? What's the direction you're steering the ship? Uh, well, I always uh, – I think everybody knows Lancaster. Everybody knows Lancaster it's Archery. Lancaster. Is it Lancaster? <laughs> yeah, I've uh, been there. Everybody I know pronounces that Lancaster, <laughs> but okay. Uh, I, I guess it's a Western Eastern thing. But in any event, um, that's like the the universal place that people buy stuff from. 
uh, that they need in general, especially the target archery side of things. But in general, it's a very common place, and it's probably the most known archery place. And there's nothing in the West like that, nothing even remotely close to that. And when I started dabbling down this online road, I went, well, wouldn't it be nice if I had everything someone could possibly ask me for, period? Yep. So that's the goal. West Coast, um, Lancaster. I haven't, uh, I haven't paid myself more since I bought it from my dad. Um, I've paid myself the exact same wage for nine years. Um, and I am going to continue to do that until I feel like I have enough product to where there's no question. Like if, if you want something for everyday usage, archery hunting related, I have it. But I'm not where I want to be. I want to keep growing it and growing it and growing it to where my, my whole goal originally when I when my when I bought my dad out because he um we give, give, giving that. a little story again so at um I want to say it's almost 10 years ago now um was late July early August and my dad he wasn't working a ton but he was still around uh, in the shop and owned the place and kind of let me do what I want for the most part, but I'd have to bounce stuff off of him and whatnot. And I, if there were smaller decisions, I'd just make them and I wouldn't ask. But bigger decisions, I'd still talk to him about. And um, he went to the hospital because he, uh, he couldn't walk to the mailbox and back. Now, uh, it's probably only 120 yards down his driveway from the front door to the, the mailbox and back. And he couldn't get there without sitting down and practically like feeling like he was going to pass out. So he got in his truck and drove to the hospital, and they wouldn't let him leave. Um, and I got the call when I was at the shop um, that he um, that your dad's in the hospital. They want to do open heart surgery, and you need to get down here as soon as you can. And there was still, I think I had one employee at that time. Uh, not that wasn't me, obviously. And um, so I, I, I couldn't, and I don't even know if they were an adult. I, I think they might have been a teenager. Uh, so I was like, as soon as I can close the shop, I'll come down. Um, and uh, came down, and he's uh, he's sitting in a bed with stuff all hooked up to him and whatnot. And that was like a, a pretty brutal slap in the face. And a if, if little backstory, my dad, he uh, he smoked like a chimney, um, was a was a pretty strong drinker for probably about a decade in there, and then he quit drinking. Um, but he always uh, always drank a lot of coffee, a lot of stimulant, and like two packs a day kind of cigarette smoker oh, guy, right? Uh, well, he was he was a, a high anxiety human being. Yep. He just was always stress, wired. always stress. Like when he, <laughs> like when I finally bought him out, he didn't know what to stress about, and it was like a year of a struggle of what the hell do I do because I don't know how to live without just worrying about something, but. <laughs> Um, in any event, um, we go in there and he, he, uh, he looks at me and goes, well, they want to, they want to do four bypasses on my heart and he goes, should I let them do it? And I look at him and I go, it depends. Are you going to be any different? He goes, what's that supposed to mean? I was like, if you're not going to change your life and how you live it, don't waste anybody's fucking time. Yep. Like if you were going to quit smoking and you're going to eat healthier, because, I mean, he ate, like, the fattiest stuff. and he, But he was thin because he was so high stress that he yeah. was always working. You know, he wasn't ever fat that I can ever remember. But he uh, he lived an unhealthy lifestyle. And I, I said, look, if you're not going to go home and eat vegetables and see if you make it. But don't spend this immense amount of money because they didn't have good insurance either. Yeah. You know, so that was like a – it was we were staring at probably a close to a six-figure expense. Yeah, having, a having like, a, a six-figure <laughs> surgery to uh, – to try to do a, a four-way bypass, and he finally said, all right, I'll, I'm going to do it and um, go through it. And uh, they ended up doing a five-way instead of a four-way when they opened him wow. up. And um, and he made it through it. Uh, and then for the next month or so, he uh, he was pretty much worthless. Like, he was just complaining, and he was on pills and wouldn't do any of the exercises because he was a stubborn person. Um, and during that time, if you know... Washington in August it's was by far my busiest time of year so between that and going checking on him in the hospital working 80 90 hours and when he got home going up and checking on him at home and then taking care of anything that um that that my dad would have taken care of around the house for my mom because there's they didn't have any other kids at home I was still doing that too and uh my my siblings had um uh, not a good relationship with my father and they both came to town during that time and my sister um god bless her saved uh came home for a week and stayed with them and tried to make sure that they were at least okay at that point and um and it was it was just a a tough time at that point and then he came back 
um, and had all this energy. Like all of a sudden he didn't have he had it didn't have energy and then like I think it was around October his plumbing's working or November his plumbing was working so he had all this energy and all this <laughs> motor and for like three years or four years he finally stopped telling me what to do all the time and it was very frustrating because I felt very confident that I knew better what to do than him yeah um, with all the interactions experience I'd had well he was in just in an office now. I'd been in the trenches I felt like I knew what to do I felt like a sergeant that had a captain telling him what to do that never saw the battle right it's like come on man this stay out of it and let me let me get it working and he started coming in over the top of me and trying to tell me what to do and that made it about two weeks and i i looked at him straight in the face and i said either i'm out of here or you are and i don't f care right like i'll go i'll go do something else i'm i'm a pretty good salesman i know i don't have an education but i i feel pretty confident i can go do something else and i'll be fine i'll find work i'm not worried about that but either you are of no involvement or you sell it to me and I don't care which you decide. I'm leaving. And I came back the next day and he said, all right, I'm going to sell it to you. And whatever happens from today forward is on you. And we'll figure out an agreement. And I'll go away. Um, and it took like a year. Yeah, um, I remember that. Like I, I uh, the legal fees were ridiculous because we agreed to use the same lawyer. So we could just don't negotiate. Don't do that, guys. Don't do that. That's a bad idea. Um, Dude, I remember uh, it was It was bad. 31. Um, yeah. And you, I had been doing Dave Ramsey with Alicia. So how old are you right now? I'm 42. I'll be 43 in May. Okay, so that was 12 years I ago. I think. <laughs> so when I was 28, I had opened the gym for a couple of years. Uh, I didn't take a salary the first year. Yeah. And we were living in a very small 900-square-foot house that I bought when I was 21. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't have any babies. And Alicia was still in like nursing school. She already had a degree, but bottom line is we were dirt freaking poor. And we had separate checking accounts mm -hmm. and she was always over withdrawing and I was kind of like pretty disciplined and saved mm -hmm. money. And so we agreed to like do Dave Ramsey mm -hmm. and like the snowball debt steps. Mm -hmm. And I remember you just openly telling me at age 31, like I th we had a good conversation about money and yeah. we've always been pretty damn transparent with each other. And you're like, yeah. Mm -hmm. I told you what I was doing. You're like, dude, that's cool. I, I, I just paid my house off or my house has been paid off for I don't know how long. And mm. I remember looking at you going like that inspired me. I was like, yeah. this this MFJJ mm. guy is 31. He, he, he works at an archery shop and he's got his house paid off. And it just like that was fuel yeah. for my fire. Yeah, but that wasn't because I made a lot of money. That was just because. Um, so I, I have to give credit where credit's due on that. I remember you had said, oh, so you do Dave Ramsey. And I said, who's Dave Ramsey? Oh, my God. Yeah, but you were just a <laughs> I was unicorn. like, what? What are you talking about? I don't know. But um, but my uh, my cousin, um, uh, Justice Snyder, uh, he was – we started bow hunting together because um, he was a rifle hunter for a long time. He's like, I right. want to get into bow hunting. It's like, well, tell you what. Let's go hunting together. You know, I, I, I always loved my cousin, enjoyed him a lot. And was like, Hey, you know, I know it's you don't, you've never done this. You hunt with? Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. I was like, I, I know, I know you, uh, you know, we, we, you've never done this and whatnot. So maybe I can help you out a little bit, but I know you know how to hunt. So, and you and you work your ass off every time I've seen you. So it's not going to be an issue. We should be fine. And we took a week up into the Coeur d'Alene's, didn't even have an encounter. Uh, you know, we heard bugling and whatnot, but could never right. get close to anything. Got really close to some wolves and that kind of scared both of us because neither of us were carrying a handgun. Um, but and throughout that talking, he, I learned that he didn't know any money. And he was younger than I was. Then. Like, he's older than me, but at that time, like, right. he's, I, was, I was like, you don't, you mean you don't have a mortgage? Like, no. You don't have a car payment? No. Like, you don't owe anybody anything? It's like, no. And that was the first time that it registered in my head that, oh, that's possible. Because I had credit cards and I had car payments oh, and God. I had a mortgage and oh, all that. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. Wow. So I started what I didn't realize was Dave Ramsey's thing and just said, okay, well, I just looked at it logically like I do most things. And I went, okay, what's the smallest one and get that paid off and then roll that into the next one and roll, roll that in the next one and roll that in the next one. I, I didn't, it wasn't a system that I was aware of existed, but that's what I did. And I think it was a period of six years but here's from where start this comes to finish. In the, the other story is like, so here's Josh 31 gives his dad an ultimatum. And honestly, I'm glad you did, right? It was necessary. But as hard as it was, it was necessary. You were able to leverage this paid off asset to acquire a new asset. Yeah. Uh, even though I don't know if the business was quite an asset yet, but I mean, no, it is a tax it, shelter. Uh, yeah. And it is yeah. going to be in your control. Yeah. So if it is going to be profitable, it's up to you. 
Hundred percent. Yeah. What basically what it panned out to on paper was as long as it made the exact same amount of money as it did, I wouldn't go backwards. It would be even, and I had to mortgage my house um, to be able to give them enough upfront money so they could then return remove all their debts, and they didn't have any expenses, and then they just got a monthly payment for twenty years on the the building and the property that they owned. But I so I walked into that buying all the inventory and all the contents for more than I should have. Um, and the building and the property for uh, close to fair, um, you know, in his interpretation, it was worth more because of, well, this is a, an event center, blah, blah, blah. No, this is 13 acres with a pole building on it with uh, that's heated, insulated, and two bathrooms and a plumbing system that works. Uh, that's it. That's what it is. It's not more than that. I'm not going to give you more money than that. And so we, I went up a little bit from what he wanted but the biggest thing was i had to come up with 220 grand cash yeah so uh, at that time of payoff well i, I had I, I i leveraged my house and then i had saved uh at that point i want to say like 60 grand and so i went down to ten thousand uh, dollars in my, in my in my checking account but the way it was set up is that as the as the mortgage had to get paid, the business was paying a loan back to me for it. So I didn't have to pay the mortgage. So I still was making, you know, my same wage as I made, you know, a decade ago um, that I didn't really have an outgoing expense for. So I knew I'd recover yeah. unless unless the business took a shit, um, which I didn't expect to happen. But the, the next um, six years were very stressful. I want to pause right there for a second. I want to give some takeaways. The stuff fires me up. Sure. Six years of Josh making disciplined decisions enabled him to leverage himself and bet on himself on a potential business that could do really well. I love that. And I always preach on this podcast, like have a side hustle, gamble on yourself, invest in yourself. Look, you know, People are always looking for, you know, which way to make investments or whatever. I like the idea of buying an, an established business and putting your energy into it, like looking for a business to buy or um, I'm not a real estate guy. I suck at real estate, although my wife's pretty good. Mm -hmm. But um, neither one of us are really money chasers. No. We're more like passion chasers. It's, yeah, lifestyle chase. But I just want to applaud you for being such a young guy. You know, you probably got hosed a little bit on the deal, but you really, at the end of the day, saved your parents. It turned out well. Right. And I and I knew that I was going to be able to take care of my parents. And I knew that um, as they aged, I would live right next door. Or I would work right next door to where they lived, um, which has been very beneficial, even recently super beneficial. Well, let's get into it. Um, all right. Well, I mean, um, so when Josh said that um, he looked at his dad in the hospital, was like, well, are you willing to change? And then, um, obviously, his dad had the surgery. And yeah. Then, um, I remember being friends with you while you were working through the buyout. And mm -hmm. I'll be honest, Josh, there was years where I never saw your dad, like, after you bought him out. Like, yeah. I didn't. And then, I don't know if you remember this. It wasn't that long ago. I'm in the shop, and your dad walked in, <laughs> in yeah. the corner down there. Yeah. I didn't know who that guy was. A Gray hair, big long hair, down big there, beard, <laughs> beard, like some hippie, like a her, like a hippie hermit. A hippie yeah, hippie hermit walks in, <laughs> yeah. and they're talking about some sort of like the guy, pile that needs to get burned. The guy who gave me crap about wearing a hat and not being clean shaven every day. And I'm like, <laughs> it, was that your dad, Mark? And you're like, yeah. And I was just like, it it really looked like he had transcended, and like he looked the best I've ever seen him. Yeah, he was happy. I mean, he looked. He was he was happy and uh, and I, I think relatively content. Um, he was he was a very uh, godly man, even though he made decisions that were selfish. Um, he really believed in God and um, and cared about other people way more than I ever realized. I mean, I still saw it. Like I I spent more time with my dad than any other human being, mm -hmm. I think, on this planet at this point um and he i still you still don't see it until until they die and then you see it and mm. then you get um 
You know, it's funny. I've talked about this a lot, and it has not bothered me after the first 30 to 45 days. Um, and I, I think it's going to, and you were right, I'm probably going to cry. But uh, um, you learn, you really learn who your parents are after they die. Hmm. Who they, what they meant, and what they did. And there were, my dad meant a lot to a lot of people. And I never really truly appreciated it. I thought I did, but I didn't. Um, and so every time I have an opportunity, I try to bestow that on someone else. Saying, you know, put your trivial crap aside and know your parent. Because they're not always going to be there. You think they are. And everybody knows their parent's going to die someday. But you never, it never happens when you expect it. And it never happens. Um, you never get as much time as you want. But, um, but yeah, I just, we, I'm really glad that he, um, that he had his bypass. And I'm really glad that um, I bought him out. Because the last nine years I had changed my perception of my father so much. Like, we did not have a good relationship before that. I mean, I still love my dad and wanted to please my dad. But in my early 20s, I realized that was an impossible task. <laughs> it was yeah. impossible to please my dad. You know, being up 30% in a month and he just looks at you and goes, how come you weren't up 40%? It's like, that's better than you ever did. And you're just still telling me it's not good enough. Yeah. Because that's what a, that's what a kid's going to hear, or even a, a an adult of a of a from their parent. That's yeah. what they're going to hear, and that's what they're going to see, and um, that's why I am who I am. There's no question in my mind that why I work as hard as I do, why I do as much as I do, why I push as hard as I do, why I stay late, why I go in early, why I always I I didn't take a vacation for like 13 years. This ever. is the first. 2021 was the first season I've actually ever seen you bow hunt very much. I give yeah. you a lot of crap on the channel about, yeah. yeah, you know a lot about archery, but I have hunted more than you. This was the first year I've seen you actually like go hunt. And it was so cool to be like, so how was your was hunt, great. Josh? And here, like, I actually had did. something to say. Yeah, yeah. It, it was, was, it, was really cool. it was great. And I'm, I'm really I'm fortunate that I, I started to do that before he died because then he got a little excited mm -hmm. about what I was doing. And we hadn't um, we hadn't hunted together for, oh, God, like 14 years or 15 years. And he asked me every year, and I told him I was too busy. I was like, I, I got this going. I got that going. I got that going. Dad, I don't have time. I don't have time. I don't have time. I have, next time. Next time, right? And for one reason or another, a week before he died, I asked him to go hunting with me. You asked him. I asked him. And I still don't know why I did. Like I wasn't I wasn't quite there yet, but it was getting to a point that I felt like I cuz I mean when you when you grow up hunting with your parent and they kind of lay out everything for you and you're trying to learn. You're still working, you're still doing a lot of stuff and you're still helping contribute to the task. But the reality of being able to give it back at some point was really cool and I was actually somewhat excited it's like I'm not going to hunt with my dad again until I can take him hunting to something I've done yep that was that was what I wanted and I finally got to a point that I had bought property and was start, starting to set up a place that I would go hunting every year that I owned um, and I had invited him a week before he died and he said he'd think about it and then my mom told me how excited he was that I did that and a week later he died uh -huh. so at least at least he died thinking I wanted to hunt with him again. Because I, I wouldn't have, I don't know if I'd ever been able to forgive myself if he, if he died thinking I didn't ever want to do that with him again. Um, that'd have been, that'd have been really hard to, uh, to have to live with. So um, I'm very, very grateful and very thankful that I, that came out of my mouth for some reason. It's weird, you know, Thank when, God. Yeah. when somebody, when somebody dies, the things that happened around that situation before they died that didn't really make a whole lot of sense at the time. Mm -hmm. Like my dad, the last three months he was alive, he did more work on that house and that area than I'd ever seen him mm -hmm. do. And he was almost done. Like he was like a week from being done with all the work when he had a heart attack and died. And he died on a Tuesday sometime between 9 a.m. and noon or 12, 15. 
my wife thinks it's like 12.04 because a clock in our house stopped at 12.04. Like the battery died Holy shit. at 12.04 and just stopped. And consequently, we don't use that clock anymore, but we keep it. Absolutely. Uh, we just bought another clock and just kept that. So, so I guess a, a small part of me thinks maybe it was 12.04. Um, but my, my mom works with me and has worked with me through the whole buyout and everything. She does the book, she handles the money and she is the, the saving grace for me mentally. Why I don't have to stress about money or what's going on over there. I can kind of ignore it because I know my mom handles it and I don't have to think twice about, uh, is that person stealing from me? Are they doing it correctly? Etc. I just get to go, Hey, it's mom. I'm cool. Yep. So thank you so much. She's, uh, she's, she's always been the, the rock of yep. our family, hands down. Uh, but in any event, uh, we, we were BSing a little bit because she usually only works about three, four hours a day, you know, when she comes in. And some days she doesn't work, and then other days she'll work a little longer, just to, however much it takes to get the bookkeeping done. Um, and we BSed a, little, BSed a little bit, and the archery shop front door is 150 yards from my parents' house. And so she left and started walking up to the house, and I dreamt in the old 92 Toyota to go get lunch, which I never do because I almost always bring lunch with me. It's yeah. very rare. But um, it was a week before I was going to go hunting, and I was really mentally preoccupied with other stuff yeah. and getting things together and getting yeah, things you ready. Always eat the first at the shop. Yeah, it was the food. first week, like the first time I was going to go hunting on my property where it was set up for a week. Like I was so excited. <laughs> it's like I'm going to be gone for nine days on a piece of property that I own with all the work I've done. And I got a really good chance of killing an elk, like 90, 95% chance. And to be able to do that in Washington is very difficult oh for, all, you know, to, to be able to buy an over the counter tag and just harvest any elk. It's not, it's not easy uh, in this state. So I was pretty jacked and pretty excited. And um, so I wasn't, I didn't prep lunch and I would like the whole week. I'm like, I'm just not even going to make lunch so I can spend the time getting all my gear together. So I'm just ready to go when it's time. And I probably would have ended up ducking out early on Friday that week and gone up and been 100%. gone for maybe an extra half a day. Um, and I jump in the truck and I drive about a mile away and my phone rings and it's my mom and I, I've got, you know, hands free in the truck. So I answer it and she goes, your dad's down, get down here now. And I, flipped a bitch in the middle of the road, drove through some poor guy's field. I still need to go apologize to that guy uh, to turn around. And I, I got, I think I got up to like 85, 90, just trying to get back and uh, pull into the front and their, their driveway goes around to the back of their house. And I pulled into the front, literally jumped out of my truck. I think it was still running and I was running all over yelling, mom, mom, mom. And she wasn't, she wasn't yelling. Uh, and I went inside, I ran upstairs, nothing, nothing, nothing. And then I went, oh, he's on the back. And I ran to the back. And she's in there doing chest compressions on him. She's got 911 on speaker and she's just sobbing. I've never, I've never seen my mom cry like that in anything. And she's, you know, she's had to put down horses and, you know, she, she's, I just, she's lost, uh, grandparents, parents. I've never seen her cry like that. And I, I can just, I could just hear her sobbing and doing one, two, three, four, while they're talking to her on the phone and seeing my dad, I've seen a lot of dead things in my life and he was gone. Like you can, the eyes were glossed over, you know, and it's like, yeah, he's, but you know, you don't not try. Right. Yep. Um, and I got, I was there for maybe like a minute. I don't think I've ever felt so helpless in my life. And then I hear the, the fire engine coming because the, where the where the archery shop is, like an eighth of a mile down the road, is the is the the firehouse, which Station is where five. you so yeah, which is where you were for a bit, yeah, uh, when you were gonna think about being a firefighter, and um, so I ran back out in the front and you know got the guys and showed them where he was, and um, I want to say, oh god, at least twenty people showed up. Yep. Between all the different emergency crews that showed up, the different fire departments that got called, the the police, the and we always the chaplain. Had a medic. And when I worked yeah. at that station, we always had a medic at every shift. So yeah. you're going to get the best chance. Yeah. And literally, you can almost yeah. throw a rock at this fire station. Yeah, I, I could hit it with an arrow. From it's that close. I could. I mean, I can shoot an arrow that far. I'd not a, not necessarily accurately, but I can. You can chuck an arrow that far. I'd be stuck working um, a twenty four hour shift there, and I could see your shop. And I'd be like, <laughs> yeah. it'd be slow, and I'd yeah. be like, God, I just can I just walk over here with the radio and shoot, yeah. and then call me if something, you know. But anyway, so yeah. they show up. They show up, and they they have this device that does the chest compressions mechanically. Yep. 
Um, and it, you can hear it like they get it on him. My mom's been doing chest compressions for probably six minutes now, seven minutes. She's just, she's exhausted and she's just bawling. And, uh, they put that thing on him and you can like hear his ribs popping. Like, and it's like legit. Like yep. if that doesn't bring you back, nothing's bringing you back. And you can see his like stomach pushing out. Like it was, it's a hard thing to watch, but, um, and, but you know, and I grab my mom and I hold my mom and she's just, just gone, you know, mentally, emotionally weak. Um, sorry. Uh, and I, I wanted to, um, I wanted to just collapse, you know, but, um, somebody's got to be there to hold her up. 100%. So, um, and they, I think it was about, it was probably about 15 to 20 minutes before they finally called it. And if that had happened a week later, she'd have been there by herself. If that had happened two weeks prior, when I was antelope hunting, eight hours away, she'd have been there by herself. So, it, and it, if it had happened on a Monday or a Sunday, like a Monday, I'd have, I'd have still been there because I'd have been at the shop you know, doing fulfillment and whatnot. And if it was like on a Sunday, I, I would have been eh, 10 minutes away. You know, it would take me longer to get there. If it, uh, um, if, if it had happened a different day, it wouldn't have been a lot worse. And I'm just, I'm really thankful and, and grateful that as hard as it was to see that and be a part of that, it would have been a hundred times harder for my mom if I hadn't have been. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then, you know, you, you go inside and you start calling all the family members and telling them that he died. You know, you're 67, so it was a really big shock to everybody. Um, yeah, it, was, I think it was a month prior to that that um, that my wife and I were talking about our, our dads because neither of them have been the pillar of health. Sure. Um, and we were, we, we, I just said, you know, I think we need to be pretty realistic about the fact that one of them is going to die in probably the next two or three years. You know, and um, <laughs> it was a month later my dad died. Um, it was just, uh, I, I was, I like to say that I was prepared for it, probably more prepared than my siblings were, um, just because the doctor had told me when they, when they gave him his bypass, it's like, he's bought 10 years. Wow. It'd been nine. It'd been a little over nine because he had his... He has bypassed in, I want to say, late July, early August, and nine years plus a month. Yep. So you know, they called that one pretty good. Um, and he'd had, he had three or four warnings, and he was just being a stubborn, tough guy. Yeah. And not going to get checked out. And two weeks prior, my mom almost took him. And he said, no, let's see what happens in the morning. Let's just give it till tomorrow. And he felt a little better, so he never went. Um, and that's... You got warning signs, go. Your your parents start complaining about stuff that's a warning sign, make them go. Don't just let them be strong and tough. And, you know, it's it's great to, to have the level of strength to push yourself through adversity and things that challenge you, which is but life is nothing but adversity. Mm -hmm. And if you don't push your way through it, you're just going to be weak, struggle, or play the blame game your entire life and be the victim. And so I, I, I do applaud people for pushing their way through adversity and pain, but when, don't screw around with hard stuff. If you feel weird things that you don't recognize that are like warning signs, just go get it looked at. And I consequently have had work done now that I might not have. Um, All I want to do right that, now after this podcast yeah. is just call my dad. I already talked to him today. Yeah. And uh, he called me. I've been an ass and been busy. And he calls me this morning and... FaceTime. Take the time, you dipshit. And I'm like, we had, and then I'm like, well, we got to get the kids off school, got to go, Dad. But I just, and I haven't hunted with my dad that much in the last couple of years just because, uh, you know, I, I have cameramen and tags and, you know, he, he just wants to go hunt elk in brushy North Idaho. Yeah. You know what I mean? He, he just, likes what he likes. He likes the brush country. My, my dad liked what he liked. And exactly. that was the, it was the same thing, you know, he not, not really branching out from the uh, tree too far, you know. Well, let's, uh, let's yeah. recap. All the golden nuggets from this podcast for those listening. So Josh kept it real, shared some stuff I didn't know for sure, but uh, I'll let you do it. Like I like to recap every podcast with some of the takeaways, not only for life, not just for archery, family, 
But I think my takeaway is um, you get one shot on this rock and you leave behind a legacy. I don't need money. I don't need things. I don't – it's the relationships that I have is what I cherish the most. And just listening to you and how much you loved your dad and, and how much he really taught you, maybe not the best way, but his way. Yeah. I'm literally going to make sure that I get a hold of my mom and my dad today and just let them know how much I appreciate all the sacrifice they've done for me. That's my takeaway from today's podcast. Yeah, mine, um, the impact you can make on people is your legacy, no matter what it is. And the more, the more lives you can change and the more, the more paths you can make a little straighter. Um, that's the, that's what you leave behind. It's not money. It's not power. It's not control. It's not. It's none of that. Uh, the things that you typically tend to strive towards, you know, the control, freedom of decision, or what have you. You know, um, money, money, and money and debt is a is a is crippling. Um, don't you know, definitely do everything within your power to not be. My my dad always said, and I got out of it way earlier than he did he said the, the borrower is servant to the lender so whoever you owe money to owns you whether you like it or not don't be in that position find your way out of that position um and take every moment you have with your loved ones because they won't always be there as much as it's hard to accept that reality, the times where you go, I don't have time, make time. Do it for me. Because I don't have time anymore. Because he's gone. That's it. Separation is in the preparation. We appreciate your guys' support for this channel. Please consider subscribing to Podium Archer. I'll leave a link in the show notes for his YouTube channel. Josh is also on Instagram, and I'm trying to help him get that thing up to snuff it's at podium archer he also owns spokane valley archery shout out to nolan and forest they help run the place and uh best archery shop in the pacific northwest i'm probably biased thanks for your time josh thanks for being real we'll catch you on the next one